Good evening and welcome to tonight's meeting of the Commonwealth Club of California. You can find the club on the internet at commonwealthclub.org. I'm Larry Bensky, former National Affairs Correspondent for Pacifica Radio and former host of Sunday Salon on Pacifica stations KPFA in Berkeley and KPFK Los Angeles. I've also been a college teacher for 20 years at Stanford, Cal State University, East Bay and Berkeley City College and I'm moderating tonight's program. It's an honor and a privilege and a pleasure to be here tonight with someone I spoke with on the radio many times over the years, Dr. Noam Chomsky, Institute Professor and Professor Emeritus of Linguistics at the Massachusetts Institute of Technology and author most recently of the anthology, The Essential Chomsky. Welcome to the Commonwealth Club, Noam Chomsky. That book, The Essential Chomsky, is one of an astonishing total of 95 titles that Noam Chomsky has authored or co-authored, mostly authored, over his long and distinguished career. His academic background is, of course, in linguistics, which he studied and taught at MIT since first joining that distinguished institution in 1955. Dr. Chomsky has received no fewer than 33 honorary degrees and has spoken to major audiences and conferences all over the world. I first met him sometime in the early 1970s when he and I were both participating in a rally opposing United States government intervention in Vietnam, and we'll be, I'm sure, discussing that era and its relation to the contemporary era tonight. First, though, I wanted to begin by asking you, Noam, and I'm going to presume the Noam not out of a false sense of familiarity, but because <laughs> we do go back a ways. There was an article the other day in the New York Times, you may have seen the headline, MIT taking student blogs to nth degree. And a student was quoted in paragraph two as saying, MIT is the closest you can get to living in the internet. As you know, there's a great deal of pulling of hair and gnashing of teeth on the part of journalists and journalism people these days about the decline and disappearance of newspapers, the shrinking content of newspapers. Are we going through a phase where so much attention is changing from the traditional means of information delivery to something else that we should be concerned that something vital to democracy is being lost? Or is this just another transformation as we see from time to time over the centuries in the way that people get information from each other? I think something's being lost. Uh, we can all you know, put up blogs on the internet and express our opinion, it's a good thing. Uh, but uh, there has to be, there have to be uh, foreign bureaus doing uh, inquiry and domestic bureaus. Somebody's got to be researching. Now, I don't necessarily admire the way the major media do it. I think there are plenty of flaws in that. But nevertheless, it is a source of information that can't be duplicated by uh, people at their computers. They can, you can get access to a wide range of information, but uh, you know even even that is based on reporters on the ground, and uh, if they're gone, uh, a lot is gone that can't be replaced. But nevertheless, the bloggers at MIT or people in this room or people listening to us on the radio now have access to a greater range of contact with other human beings on the planet all over the place and can get input and information that uh, you have so elegantly written about over the years is filtered out of the mainstream media. It's filtered out, but the contact with people on the ground is not going to replace that. I mean, if we, I mean, there are many things that are happening right now that are critically important that you can't find in the major media. I, mean, I could give examples, but uh, uh, contacting people in uh, other countries is not going to provide that information. Face this. Well, we do have live, organized people in this country, as we've seen over the past few months, but they're not the live, organized people that you and I grew up belonging to and being active with. Uh, they are live, organized people who mostly are responding to calls from right-wing commercial radio station commentators and television hosts who are 
doing things like protesting against taxation, against the government, against what they call socialism, against the uh, Obama health care plan, whatever they think of it as. Uh, what do you make of this kind of um, what Pat Buchanan once called peasants with pitchforks uh, approach to public policy coming from the right uh, in the streets and in the media of this country with a certain amount of vehemence and a certain following as well. There were, I don't know how many people, but it seemed to me from looking at television coverage, maybe a couple of hundred thousand people who marched in Washington a couple of weeks ago under various banners mm -hmm. of the right. What do you make of this and the implications for small d democratic government in the United States? Well, I, I think the implications are uh, d dangerous, but I mean, it's easy to ridicule them. You know, look at the crazy things they say, you, you want to kill my grandmother, uh, you know, and so on. And there's a lot of nonsense, that's true. But what we really ought to be asking ourselves is uh, why the uh, peace movement, the left, the activist organizations aren't organizing these people. I mean, a lot of what they're protesting is, uh, is pretty sensible. I mean, a lot of the protests, for example, are against the bailout, the massive bailout. You know, they feel uh, uh, that they were uh, uh, betrayed. You know, they, they pressured, worked very hard to prevent it, and two minutes later they got it. And uh, why should the uh, uh, you know, bankers end up from the recession more powerful than they were before, which is what's happening. You can read it in the business press. They're exulting about it. Uh, they're more powerful than they were before. They're, you know, the big banks are even bigger than they were. Uh, the government insurance policy, the too-big-to-fail insurance policy, is guaranteeing them that they can continue doing exactly what they were doing, which tanked the economy. Uh, they can take risky, make risky loans and investments. Uh, since it's risky, they'll make a lot of profit. They'll have money coming out of their ears. If it collapses, the taxpayer will come in and bail them out because they're too big to fail. Uh, 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 bonuses and uh, profits are going through the roof, and meanwhile, people are suffering. Well, they have a reason to protest that. Uh, and, uh, but but it, the tragedy is that the protests are, and many other things, the protests are being organized by pretty much the same sectors that are creating the crisis. I mean, the corporate money that's behind them is the ones who are very happy that it's coming out like this. And, uh, and, the, the, uh, and it's a real failure of, of the activist movements, the left, the peace movement, and so on, that we're not organizing. I think that's the question we ought to ask. And there are other things. I mean, there are historical memories that are awakened. You don't want to draw analogies too closely, but uh, there's... There's some similarities which are not encouraging, uh, certainly for someone my age. Uh, th these people have real grievances. I mean, I have not seen a demographic analysis of you know, uh, those who call in on talk shows, but I listen to them a lot, uh, and they're interesting. I mean, if you sort of suspend disbelief, you forget about reality in the, of the world, and just listen. It's not a joke. If you listen, the message that comes across is, has an internal logic to it. It's coherent. It gives answers to people who want answers and need them and deserve them. They're crazy answers, but they're not hearing any others. I mean, these are people who've, you know, worked hard. Uh, they're uh, uh, done everything right. You know, a Christian, God-fearing, uh, and take care of their families, and and for th for 30 years they've been shafted. Uh, but uh, somebody's got to give them an answer. Why? The media has always had the function in this country of suspension of disbelief, but that has traditionally been called entertainment. What you're saying is the suspension of disbelief has. Um, We've left Edward R. Murrow behind a long time ago, that uh, firewall between the entertainment, the uh, Jack Benny part and Milton Berle part of media, for those of you who go back that far, and the uh, Edward R. Murrow part of media, that wall has come down, 
And uh, what you're now saying is that the suspension of disbelief is a characteristic of especially broadcast media in all of its domains, supposed entertainment, infotainment, and information. That's happening, but I don't really think that's the main problem. I was not a great admirer of the media in the earlier period. In I fact, know. I think they're pretty awful. In many ways, I think they're better now than they were 30, 40 years ago, because the country is better. It's a more civilized country. The media reflect that. Uh, I think I, I'm not really thinking about the entertainment aspect of the media, though yes, it's significant. Um, thinking about the part that has uh, substantive content, crazy content, but it is substantive. Uh, it does give answers. I mean, to people who, who for the last 30 years have seen their uh, wages, uh, income stagnate or decline, uh, uh, benefits decline, uh, uh, services decline, there is nothing for the children, you know, the world's out of control. Uh, these are the people who on polls, maybe 80% of them, say uh, the country's going in the wrong direction, the, uh, the government's run by the few and the special interests, not the people, and so on. You know, they're not wrong. Uh, this is all happening to them, and the answers that they're getting from, say, you know, Rush Limbaugh, Michael Savage, the rest of them, are, uh, well, we have an answer. Uh, the rich liberals uh, own everything. They own the corporations. They run the government. Uh, they uh, run the media. And they don't care about people like you. They don't care about the flyover people between the East Coast and the West Coast. They only care about uh, giving everything you worked for away to, um, you know, to illegal immigrants or you know, gays or something. So we got to protect ourselves from them. And furthermore, they run the government. Uh, when they put up a health program, it's not to give you health. It's to kill your granny. You know? And that's an answer to something. It's a terrible answer, but it is an answer. Uh, and uh, if you do suspend disbelief, you forget about what's happening in the world, really. It's a coherent answer. Now, they're not hearing anything else. And the memory that comes to my mind again, I don't want to press the analogy too hard, but I, I think it's worth thinking about, is late Weimar Germany. Uh, there were people with real grievances. Uh, the Nazis gave them an answer. It's the fault of the Jews and the Bolsheviks, and we've got to protect ourselves from them. Uh, uh, and that'll take care of your grievances. And we know what happened. Uh, Germany in the 1920s was you know, the most civilized, the peak of Western civilization in the, in the arts and the sciences, uh, uh, highly democratic, functioning democratic institutions. A decade later, it was, you know, the pits of human history. I don't, again, the analogy is not, it's not close, but it's frightening. And unless an answer can be given to these people, unless they can be, uh, led to understand what's really happening to them, we could be in for trouble. Well, let me ask you about the trouble that we may be in for as a race on this planet, not just as a civilization in the United States. Uh, your linguistic approach is sometimes summed up as uh, emphasizing an innate set of linguistic principles shared by all humans. Do we also have an innate sense, do you think, of principles, social principles. Are we inclined towards violence? Are we inclined towards fascism? Are we inclined towards democracy? Are we inclined towards anything? Or are those social constructs that can be altered uh, by governments and by media and by general social forces? Well, just as background, we ought to bear in mind that uh, not very much is understood about these topics. Uh, studying hum human beings are very complex objects. Um, it's hard enough to figure out what the nature of insects is. Uh, and uh, it, when you get to humans, it's much, much harder. And science has very little to say about this. You know, some suggestions, but not a lot. However, history tells us a lot. And history tells us that uh, we have all those characteristics. Uh, and we've seen it. 
you know, again, take Germany. It was the same genes in the 1920s and the 1930s, but they were very different societies. In fact, almost opposite extremes of human possibility. Possibility, and each one of us, you know, has those characteristics. I mean, every one of us could be a saint, could be a sinner, usually something in between, and circumstances and conditions make a big difference. Now, you mentioned before, let's take something concrete. You mentioned before correctly that uh, the protesters, the right-wing protesters are denouncing government. Well, where does that come from? Uh, since the Second World War, there has been a massive propaganda campaign huge propaganda campaign run by the, by the business world to try to make people hate government. But it's ambivalent because at the same time, those same sectors want a strong government, powerful state, one that works for them. When they're trying to get people to hate government, they want them to hate things like uh, services that the government provides for the population but they're not opposed to the government, the powerful government that works for them. I mean, take, say, Ronald Reagan again. He's called a conservative, but I mean, that's ridiculous. He was the most protectionist president in post-war American history. He virtually doubled protective barriers to try to protect uh, incompetent U.S. management from being overrun by, at that time, Japanese uh, uh, competitors. Uh, he. Uh, uh, he, government actually grew under on his watch. Uh, he was an advocate of big government, but big government that serves the rich and the powerful. And he left the country with a huge deficit, uh, uh, a crisis, a major crisis, uh, the savings and loan crisis. You know, not quite as bad as this one, but pretty severe. Uh, due, uh, began to deregulation, all in the interests of uh, concentrated sectors of power. Uh, he also initiate, well, he sort of pressed forward the program of uh, uh, massive inca incarceration of uh, poor and defenseless people. It turns out mostly blacks. So the incarceration rate when he came in was approximately the same as Europe, uh, maybe a little to the high end. By the time he was gone, it was out of sight. It increased further under the same tendencies increased under Clinton, they're still going on. Uh, but Reagan uh, drove it that way. Uh, actually, and, and uh, you mentioned uh, something about the internet before. Where'd that come from? I mean, that didn't come from private enterprise. That come from state intervention in the economy. It was Pentagon supported. In fact, it was developed right where I was at MIT. Same as computers, uh, uh, same with lasers. Uh, uh, you know, uh, containers that are the basis of trade, uh, microelectronics, uh, biotechnology. Are you saying I mean, technology is value neutral basically when it's no. invented I, I, or created? It, well, you know, in, in a sense it's value neutral, but in, in, a, in a society that had no structure, it would be value neutral. But in a society that has structure, yeah, it's not value neutral. But it, it didn't come, I mean, uh, uh, to a substantial extent, it came from a powerful state intervening in the economy and pursuing a program which amounts to, you know, it's pretty close to saying that uh, the public pays the costs and takes the risks and uh, eventual profit is privatized. Well, that's big government. And you can be sure that the corporate sponsors of the right-wing movements don't want to stop that. They want to keep it going, just as they admire uh, Reagan, you know, their saint. Yeah. You're listening to the Commonwealth Club of California radio program. I'm Larry Bensky. We're talking today with famed linguist, political activist, and author Dr. Noam Chomsky. Uh, Noam Chomsky, along the lines of what you were just saying, you wrote a number of years ago, we cannot say much about human affairs with any confidence, but sometimes it's possible. We can, for example, be fairly confident that either there will be a world without war or there won't be a world, at least a world inhabited by creatures other than bacteria and beetles with some scattering of others. You made allusion before to your age, your generation. Uh, do you think we've gotten any closer over the course of your lifetime to a world without war, or are we on the doomsday clock 
ticking most, mostly towards midnight? Well, I think there are tendencies in both directions. And the future of the species depends on which of those prevail. So what I said before, mentioned before about the uh, uh, escalation of nuclear weapons, well, that's uh, one of many aspects of a tendency towards destruction. On the other hand, we are a much more civilized society than we were, say, 40 years ago. What do you mean by civilized? Well, let's take some examples. Uh, take the last election, 2008. I didn't happen to like any of the candidates. But 40 years ago, or for that matter, 10 years ago, it would have been unimaginable, unthinkable, that the Democratic Party would have two candidates, a woman and an African American. That's because of changes in the society. Uh, the, the civil rights movement, the women's movement, the, uh, the environmental movement, uh, the anti-nuclear movement, the opposition to aggression, which is much stronger than it was then, and has in, uh, an inhibitory effect. Uh, let's just compare, uh, the, all of this comes out of the activism of the 60s, which is why it's so denounced and condemned it was making the society more civilized and more democratic. So, of course, it's condemned. Uh, take, say, aggression. Uh, compare the Vietnam War and the Iraq War. Okay, the, the Iraq War was bad enough, but it's, I think, the first war in history that was massively protested before it was officially launched. I say officially because we later learned that Bush and Blair had already started the war. But we didn't know at the time. Anyway, it was massively protested before it was officially launched. Uh, and that large-scale protest has had an effect. Uh, the U.S. did not apply and could not apply the tactics it applied in Indochina. They simply wouldn't have been tolerated by the population. So there's no saturation bombing. There's no chemical warfare. There, there's no... Uh, uh, you know, the sending uh, half a million troops to the country. There's no driving people into concentration camps. But there but were four million people who left Iraq left, under yeah. duress. There were several hundred thousand who were killed. There right. were probably several million who will suffer psychological consequences yeah, for enough. the rest of their lives. Yeah, it's bad enough, but it could have been worse. Uh, and the Indochina was much worse. And consider the, and in fact, in Iraq, though it's not the way it's presented in the media, but if you think about it, uh, the United States had to steadily back down from its war aims. Uh, the U.S. government fought tooth and nail to prevent elections, but they were forced to permit them. Uh, they saw, had all kind of schemes to make it, you know, uh, turn it into, let it be run by proconsuls. They were forced to accept elections. They tried to prevent the elected government from moving in a nationalistic direction. They failed. Uh, as late as November 2007, just two years ago, the Bush administration announced its, effectively announced its war aims. Uh, they were crucial parts were that the U.S. would have to uh, be a lot permitted a, 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 a permanent military presence of unspecified scale in Iraq and that the country should be open to investment, privileging U.S. investors. That's November 2007. That's the Bush Declaration, uh, which I don't even think was reported in the press, but you can find it on the internet, uh, which uh, uh, it was the, the, the proposal for the Status of Forces Agreement. Well, they had to back down, at least formally. Uh, at least formally, there's no permanent military presence. Uh, formally, there's, they haven't rammed through the kind of investment law they wanted. Uh, that's pretty significant. Uh, incidentally, uh, the, the government is not giving up uh, Obama. We can go into that. But before that, just compare it with the 60s. I mean, uh, in the 1960s, there was so little protest against the Vietnam War that most people don't even know when it was launched. It happens that in 1962, uh, John F. Kennedy uh, sent the U.S. Air Force to start bombing South Vietnam, uh, authorized chemical warfare to destroy crops and ground cover, uh, started uh, uh, authorized napalm, uh, uh, started programs which 
ultimately drove millions of people into uh, what were called strategic hamlets, basically concentration camps, to try to separate them from the guerrillas who the government knew they were willingly supporting. Uh, protest was virtually zero. I mean, I remember giving talks to uh, you know, four people in a church, and you know, the minister, the organizer, uh, uh, a drunk who walked in off the street, and uh, somebody wanted to kill me. You know. And that went on for years. But that's why you and I were involved in things called teach-ins, which is where I first But met they started you. in 65 and right. 66. That's after years of war. Right. And in fact, the large-scale protest, which finally took place, uh, was after about five years of war. By then, South Vietnam had been destroyed. Uh, the war had expanded to the rest of Indochina. Uh, and yet yeah, they were effective, but very late. And in the elite sectors, you know, the articulate sectors, like the media commentary, there was really never any, virtually never any protest in the war, of the war. It was protest on tactical grounds. Uh, it was very striking what happened by the, say, the, the end of the war in 1975, formal end of the war. Uh, the population, about 70% of the population, regarded the war as uh, fundamentally wrong and immoral, not a mistake, as the polls from roughly then. If you look at the uh, liberal commentary in the press, say at the extreme end, uh, maybe Anthony Lewis in the New York Times, his sum he summed up the war by 75 uh, by saying uh, the United States entered Vietnam with blundering efforts to do good. Well, efforts to do good is a tautology. Our state did it. It's to do good. Blundering but didn't quite work. So we entered with blundering efforts to do good, but by 1969, it was clear uh, that the war was a disaster, too costly to ourselves. Now, that's what you could read in Pravda in 1985, you know, when the Russians were in Afghanistan. But that was considered sharp critique of the war. Meanwhile, the public was way off to the uh, anti-war side. Well, let's fast forward to now. In those years, we had conscription. We had the classrooms that you and I taught in full of young men who were having to make critical decisions about what they were going to do, whether to go live in Sweden, Canada, not register for the draft, resist, or go in the military. Um, 55,000 United States military died. Some 400,000 were injured. Countless hundreds of thousands of more came back with psychological disabilities, which they suffer to this day. Here we are at this time in kind of a perpetual militarized situation in this country strike the kind of, in a perpetual militarized situation in this country where the Obama administration is now facing a decision, supposedly, about Afghanistan. Mm -hmm. But the protest against that, such as it is, is an intellectualized one, largely on the internet, to some extent in what's left of the left media. Um, we don't have conscription. It does not reach down into every classroom and every family and every neighborhood, the militarization of this country, where it does reach down into is the economy, but nobody talks about that. Well, you're, you're right, but, I, I, but uh, we have to ask, why don't we have a draft now? Well, we don't have a draft because the Army and the Pentagon and the government realized that in Vietnam they had made a tactical mistake. You cannot use a civilian army to carry out a brutal colonial war. Our predecessors didn't use colonial armies, uh, um, citizens' armies. So the French used the Foreign Legion, you know, the British used uh, the Gurkhas, or in, the, in our war, in the Revolutionary War, the Hessians, you know. Now, there was a sprinkling, the officer corps might be civilian, but uh, basically mercenary armies. Uh, by the late 60s, the, uh, you know, the top leadership realized they had made a mistake. Uh, I don't really think it's because of the effect of the draft at home. I think that's vastly exaggerated. In fact, the, you know, I mean, you were involved, I was involved. The, uh, the kind of leading edge of the uh, anti-war movement, like say the resistance, it was mostly led by uh, kids who would never get drafted, like theology students or uh, students at the elite universities. If they didn't want to get drafted, they didn't have to. Uh, they put themselves on the line. They faced uh, serious dangers, uh, many years in jail, uh, uh, egg, permanent exile, 
That's not an easy decision for an 18-year-old kid. They did it. It was very courageous. It spread. It had a big effect. Uh, but that can't be recognized in the mainstream doctrine. It's, it's dangerous to recognize that people can take honorable, courageous actions on principled grounds. You're supposed to go as far as, say, Anthony Lewis. Uh, tactical error cost us too much. Uh, uh, well, let's uh, let's uh, pull out. Actually, that's like Obama. Uh, he's considered a in the in the doctrinal system a principled opponent of the Iraq War. Uh, what was his opposition? He said it's a strategic blunder. Again, that's the same kind of thing you could have read in Pravda in 1985 and did read. Uh, people who said the invasion of Afghanistan was a strategic blunder. We don't call that principled opposition. I mean, you could have found that in the German general staff after Stalingrad. You know, two front wars, a strategic blunder. Uh, what's significant is principled opposition. And that did exist in the 60s. It still exists. In fact, in the case of Afghanistan, uh, the protest is greater than it was in Vietnam at any comparable stage of the war. You go back to when there were 60,000 troops in Vietnam, uh, cons conscripts, protest was almost zero. Uh, it wasn't even talked about. What do you mean protest? I don't see any protest these days very much at all, unless oh, you yeah. count my emails. Yeah, there's a, <laughs> there's a national day of protest coming up. There. Yes, there is, on October 17th. Okay. All right, that's massive protest. <laughs> that's the first one in about two years. I mean, what I'm yeah, saying but, is... But, in, got... but in, the, in the 60s, there was nothing. For okay, a while. that's a big difference. What do you make of the fact that the debate in officialdom over Afghanistan now seems to be either let's turn it into another Vietnam, let's keep pouring troops in for one strategic goal or another, or let's pull back to the Joe Biden solution, which is basically airborne death squads. Send in the predators, we'll find out where they are, maybe we'll know, maybe we won't. There'll be a lot of collateral damage, but at least our boys and girls won't be in danger. And those seem to be the permissible contours in Washington of the debate. Massive uh, military intervention with consequent great loss of life, or surgical, as they say, military intervention with less loss of life on the side of the interveners, yeah. but probably equal or greater loss of life on the part of the subject population. Yeah. Uh, again, that's, that's correct. But I'm not suggesting that there has been a shift in elite attitudes. There's been a shift in popular attitudes. Uh, so, and uh, when they talk about massive intervention, it doesn't even begin to compare with uh, Vietnam. I mean, they're talking about maybe 100,000 people. By 1965, when protests started, they were talking about hundreds of thousands, uh, and, uh, plus, you know, 50, 70,000 mercenaries and so on. Uh, so yes, those are the parameters of debate, and it's our fault that those are the parameters. For example, we ought to be pointing out that uh, there's a fundamental problem in the debate in Washington. The relevant voices aren't even being heard. I mean, these decisions should be made by Afghans. We don't have any right to make a decision as between uh, Biden and McChrystal. Uh, it's, uh, and, and it's interesting. Uh, Sunday's New York Times had a full page of what should we do about Afghanistan? Ten different opinions, not a single one of which was by an Afghani person. Yeah, and, and they, you know, they have voices. Um, for example, there's an Afghan peace movement, pretty significant one. You can find out about it, but you're not going to read about it here. Uh, they have spokespersons, quite eloquent ones, uh, some of them pretty impressive. Uh, the most impressive that I know is a, a woman named uh, Malalai Joya, who's a remarkable woman. She's survived somehow, miraculously, uh, struggling against the Russians, against the uh, Reagan's favorite, the murderous warlords who took over and were so outrageous that the population welcomed the Taliban. She struggled against them, uh, struggling against the return of the war warlords, which is essentially the current government. Got elected to parliament uh, with a lot of support. 
uh, was quickly thrown out because she denounced the warlords who dominate the government, living underground, you know, protected. But she, she speaks. She's written a book, and it's interesting. She gives talks. And her proposal, which is that of the Afghan peace movement, and maybe that of, for all we know, the large majority of Afghans, you know, nobody looks, uh, it's, it's kind of supported more or less by the polls that are taken. But her position is uh, Afghanistan needs an invasion, an invasion of schools, uh, hospitals, roads, not an invasion of guns and tanks. Uh, Afghans will, if given a chance, will work out the problems. Uh, we don't want to, we're, we're subject to uh, an assault from the Taliban, from the warlords, and from the occupying army. And we want to get out of that attack, and we have to work it out ourselves. So help us, but not this way. But that voice is not part of the debate. I'm going to take some of our questions from the audience here at the Commonwealth Club tonight. Um, question asks, can movements like the Green Alternative Energy Movement make a true difference in the world if population continues to grow, and how can we globally ever come to an agreement to stop population growth if that's deemed necessary? There's a lot understood. I mentioned before, not too much is known about human affairs, but something is understood about population growth. There are basically two ways to retard it. One way is the Chinese way, by force. You know, and it's causing them plenty of problems, quite apart from the brutality of it. The other way to solve it is educate women. There's very good evidence that as education of women increases, uh, a population declines, fertility declines, and levels, and sometimes even literally declines. Uh, there are some remarkable examples. Uh, so take, say, India. Uh, one of the poorer provinces in India, Kerala in the south, happens to have a very enlightened government since independence. Uh, we're not allowed to say it here, but it was a communist-led government, so forget that. Cut You're that allowed out. here. It's not allowed to say it. But it was a pretty enlightened government. In fact, when Congress came in, they had to follow pretty much the same policies. Uh, literacy is extremely high. There's education of women. Uh, and fertility has uh, leveled and declined, unlike the rest of India. And it's happening in Europe, it's happening in Japan, it's happening everywhere. If women have options and choices, uh, which they don't have in most of the world, then yes, uh, population levels. In fact, in Europe and Japan, it's even declining. Uh, the, uh, so there are two methods to deal with uh, Populate with excessive population growth, and I think it's pretty obvious which one we should be pursuing. So I, I don't see that as the major problem. I mean, the, the ecological pro and environmental problems are enormous, uh, grotesque, in fact. Uh, if the species succeeds in destroying itself, as it may, it'll be either from nuclear weapons or from destruction of the environment. And in both cases, in the case of the environmental uh, uh, threats, again, there are two tendencies in opposite directions. Uh, uh, so compare it again with the 60s. Virtually no concern. The, there was environmental movement was almost nothing. Now it's just a very substantial movement. It's a substantial popular movement pressing pretty hard on uh, uh, green alternatives, uh, cutting down energy waste and so on. Uh, but there's a counter tendency, as there always is, uh, the business world. Uh, so uh, uh, just recently, within the last few weeks, the American Petroleum Institute uh, and uh, the Chamber of Commerce, the biggest business lobby and others, uh, an announced, you, know, you can read in the press, that they're inspired by the example of the health insurers who months ago knew that they had won. Uh, like front page cover of Business Week in August, uh, health insurers have won, we, we got it. They had a terrific technique which essentially killed the possibility of desperately needed health reform. Uh, they know it's going to tank the economy, but that's somewhere in the future, the personal consequences they don't care about. And, you know, they, they have a, again, not, not that they're bad people, those are, that's the way the institutions work. Well, the Petroleum Institute and Chamber of Commerce say, we're going to follow that model. 
and try to make sure that no uh, serious uh, uh, energy uh, environmental bills are passed by Congress. Now, there was an interesting split in the Chamber of Commerce. Some uh, energy corporations pulled out and say, we're not going to cooperate with this. You look at who they were, they're the ones who produce nuclear energy. So they'd like to have uh, you know, tax on fossil fuel use, then they can make more money. They'll kill us some other way. You know? but, uh, uh, and again, let me say, it's important to stress that this, these are not bad people. They're perfectly good people, just like anyone else. But they're working within an institutional framework which requires certain choices. If you don't make those choices, you're out. So the institutions require it. In fact, even the law requires it. You have to be committed to maximizing profit and growth in the short term. That's amplified by perverse incentives, like the too-big-to-fail government insurance policy, which is now even bigger than it was before, thanks to the bank bailout and the way the money was distributed, uh, and other perverse inf like, you know, incentives like uh, 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 tying uh, CEO pay to short-term gain and you know, other structures like that. Well, let me, yeah. let me ask you about another incentive that doesn't come in that way, the peak oil incentive. You're certainly familiar with that uh, theory. If it happens, uh, and you can tell us if you believe it's happening or is going to happen, uh, do you believe that it fatally endangers democracy and would move us inevitably towards nationalist or fascist policies? This is a question from the yeah. audience. Well, you know, my own feeling, I mean, peak oil comes sooner or later, of course, it's a finite resource, uh, but it's a, it's a complex notion. I mean, the real question is not how much oil is underground, but how much can be extracted at a, an economically feasible price. Now, it's, it, it's pushing the limits now. Uh, oil extra, uh, extraction is more and more costly and more and more environmentally dangerous because you're going after... Uh, sources that are harder to use. At some point, it'll become impossible to continue, but nobody knows how far that point is. Uh, however, from another point of view, it's we're probably better off if peak oil comes sooner, uh, because that will reduce the use of fossil fuels and help preserve uh, environment for our grandchildren to live in. Uh, so. And business knows this. I mean, take, say, the Wall Street Journal. Uh, they've been the, the leading deniers of global warming. You read the editorial pages. It uh, you know, makes Rush Limbaugh look like a moderate. But a couple of, a couple of weeks ago, they ran a supplement on the environment, which took a very strong stand on the need for radical uh, uh, measures to try to sustain the environment. In fact, they even called for geoengineering. They said that the measures being considered in Washington aren't enough. Well, you know, there's a reason for that. I mean, these are, after all, the people who own the world. Uh, they don't want their possession destroyed. Uh, so they have mixed motives, too. But it's the population that's going to have to drive this. And in that respect, there has been you know, pretty substantial progress in the last 30, 40 years. Speaking of something the population is going to have to drive, I'm going to change topics with another question from the audience here. Right after I remind our radio listeners, they're listening to the Commonwealth Club of California radio program. I'm Larry Bensky. Our guest is Noam Chomsky, linguist, political activist, and author most recently of The Essential Chomsky, edited by Anthony Arnov. This question from the audience, uh, Noam Chomsky, is, do you think that taking money out of politics, fair election, clean money campaigns, is, first of all, possible in this country? And second of all, would it be effective in solving many of our political problems in the United States? I think it wouldn't be easy, because there are a lot of ways to get around any regulations, but it would be possible. Uh, uh, however, and it would certainly have a good effect, I mean, uh, 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 campaign funding is a remarkably good predictor of, of uh, election and also of policy. You can pretty well predict policies by looking at where the campaign funding comes from. There's good 
political science work on this. Uh, Thomas Ferguson, very fine political uh, e economist, has done extremely good work on this, and it's convincing. And in fact, we see it right in front of us all the time. So the rate of election of incumbents is overwhelming. It's like 98, 99 percent. Uh, this is happening at the same time that uh, public attitudes towards approval of Congress is in the low teens. But they're outspending their opponents. Uh, so okay, they get elected, even if people don't like them. Or just take the last election, 2008. I mean, the core of Obama's funding was financial institutions. Uh, they preferred him to McCain. Uh, they thought he'd serve them better. And it's turning out it's probably true. Uh, you can almost read off the policies of the administration from looking at the concentrated campaign funding. Uh, financial institutions are doing marvelously. So yes, taking money out of politics would be a good idea, very good. It's not going to solve all our problems. They're much deeper than that. But it would be substantial. It would be hard because there are all kind of ways to get around it. But it's an important topic, and here tendencies are going in the wrong direction. Uh, right now, the Supreme Court is uh, considering uh, a suit which, you know, what it amounts to is uh, uh, allow, if, they, if they approve, if they change the law, which they probably will, it means that corporations can buy elections directly instead of indirectly. <laughs> so that, they don't put it that way, but you think through it, that's what it amounts to. So that's what the Supreme Court is doing. Uh, and there's something kind of surreal going on, because at the very same time, uh, the logic of this for the Supreme Court is that corporations are persons. They have personal rights, so therefore they have the right of free speech. That was, in fact, a, uh, a gift to the corporate world by the courts about a century ago. Uh, sh uh, conservatives who used to exist, the name does, not the category, bitterly condemned it. Uh, they called it a form of communism, a return to feudalism, and so on. But they got it, and by now they have rights way beyond persons. So because they have rights of persons, they have the right of free speech, so therefore they can buy elections directly. At the same time, Congress is there's a competition going on in Congress between the Democrats and the Republicans to see who can be more brutal in denying health care to undocumented aliens. And there's a legal argument behind that, too. They're not persons under the law. The courts have shaped American law so that if you're an undocumented alien, you're not a person. Uh, you don't have personal rights. So on the one hand, uh, corporate entities are, have rights of persons and have to be allowed to buy elections directly. On the other hand, undocumented aliens on whose backs a lot of the economy rides, they're not persons. And therefore, we, the Democrats and the Republicans, have to uh, show that we're more savage than the opposition in denying them health care. We shouldn't be allowing this to happen before our eyes. I mean, the facts are there, but they're not being discussed. There's no, they're not being addressed. And that's another serious lack of people who care about living in a civilized community. Well, um, we've reached the point in our program where we have time for only one last question from our audience, and we'll kind of come back to where we were at the beginning of this discussion with Noam Chomsky. What answer would you give to the frustrated, hardworking people, as you describe them, attracted by the narrative of the right that you listen to, Brave You, on AM Talk Radio? Well, take the fact that their uh, uh, incomes have stagnated for 30 years, their benefits decline, work hours are going up, and so on. And well, suppose they say that's because the government's giving all its money right, so to... So we should be giving them the right answer. Immigrants. The right answer is that has to do with the reconstruction of the economy that took place in the 1970s, uh, which shifted us from a high growth, relatively egalitarian economy, the 50s and the 60s, to a financial, to an, what's called a neoliberal economy, with a vast growth of financial institutions, uh, evisceration of productive capacity, uh, shifting it abroad where it's more profitable. And yeah, this uh, has lots of predictable effects. Uh, one of them is the financial crisis, crises that happen periodically. 
the growth of the financial institutions is phenomenal, and that doesn't help people. Uh, it's, it, say, in 1970, it was maybe 3% of gross domestic product. Uh, now it's well over 30%. Well, you know, that's great for Goldman Sachs and so on. It's not great for these people who are concerned that their lives are falling apart. Uh, uh, we should tell them that. We should tell them that the heroes, uh, that there is a massive business-run corporate program. Its scale is astonishing. It's been pretty well studied. It goes back to the 1950s. It was designed, as I said before, to make people hate and fear government. But in a, there's a little secret behind it. The people who are running the campaign love government, and they want it to be powerful and interventionist, but in their interest. But what people are told is supposed to hate government. So take, for example, April 15th. Okay, when April 15th comes along, in the comparable date, in a functioning democracy, people would be applauding. They say, okay, this is the day in which we get together and provide the resources for the programs that we have decided on. What could be better than that? Uh, in the United States, thanks to massive propaganda, you're supposed to hate April 15th because that's the day when some alien force you know, like from Mars, is coming down here and stealing your hard-earned money. Well, that's a real triumph in undermining and destroying the fundamental basis of democracy. And for elite opinion, you know, for business, yeah, that makes sense. Uh, they don't like democracy. Elites never do. Uh, well, that's our failure to have permitted this to happen. Uh, there's a tremendous amount of activism in the country. I, I suspect that if you can't no, count noses, it's more than in the 60s. But it's a very atomized, isolated society. Uh, people in one corner of town don't know what's happening in the other corner of town. There are separate agendas. There's sectarianism, you know, we've got to have our way, you can't have your way. Uh, the success in atomizing the society has been enormous. Uh, has the one, internet played into that? The, the internet, I think, has a complicated effect. I mean, it does separate people because you're not. Uh, we're, one thing about human beings is face to face communication means something. Uh, communicating through uh, you know, uh, a, a text message doesn't have that meaning. So it does separate people. And in fact, it contributes to the ideal of the business world, which is a society in which the elementary, the the atoms are uh, a dyad, you and the tube, but no communication other than that. And that's tremendous technique of control. So it has that effect. On the other hand, it's the, you know, it is the tool for all the organizing and uh, activist uh, act, uh, uh, efforts that go on, and also for education. So it's, you know, it's, the internet really is uh, like a lot of technology. It's fundamentally neutral, depends who's using it, and for what purpose. And how class stratified do you think it will continue to be? Do you see any tendencies towards uh, greater participation, people having more access to that technology? No. Well, there's more access, but more access alone doesn't help you. If the access that you have leads to uh, you know, more to a huge range of choices where you have no framework or structure to decide what makes sense, then it's negative. If there's more access that's guided and directed by the kind of understanding and comprehension that can really only come out of cooperative efforts. And education. If, which is a cooperative effort if it's serious. Uh, yeah, that kind of uh, access makes sense. That's very much like the sciences. I mean, suppose you're, say, a biologist, uh, uh, say the woman who just won the Nobel Prize. Uh, she didn't become a great biologist by reading everything in the biology journals or to kind of randomly picking out things that appeared in the biology journals. I mean, that's, uh, they'll destroy you. Uh, she became a good biologist by having an understanding of what to look for having a framework of comprehension and insight that comes out of cooperative activities. Science is a cooperative activity. 
uh, you know, there's occasional people who work on their own, but mostly it's highly interactive, and it, lead, it at best, you know, not always, it does lead to uh, understanding, uh, interchange, uh, communication, improvement of uh, your thinking, directing it better, and yeah, out of that comes a way to uh, kind of wade through the huge mass of information there and find out what's significant. But if all you are trained to care about is your belief system uninstructed by anything yeah. other than tradition, you're That's in a different bad. framework. That's very bad. And if what you're trained for from childhood is to pass the next test, it's worse. It destroys your thinking. There's a name for that. It's called No Child Left Behind. <laughs> uh, and, uh, which, which really means every child left behind. I and mean, if that's uh, every one of us is, you know, we've mostly gone to good schools and so on. I'm sure you have the same experience I've had. Uh, y you, you, you had to pass an exam, maybe the SATs or whatever it is. So you study like a maniac. You pass the exam. You forget everything the next day. Uh, because that's not the way to learn anything. Uh, I was talking to a teacher the other day, actually, while I was here. Who, who very, like most teachers, very much opposed to all of this. And she was describing, she has a daughter in the schools. Uh, I forget what grade, but she was telling me that her daughter is in a class where uh, they were studying the Constitution. And the teacher said, meant, told the class, or maybe the book told them, that Georgia didn't participate in the Constitutional Convention. And her daughter came home and told her, she said, you know, I was curious, I want to know why. So I asked the teacher why didn't Georgia join? And the teacher's answer was, well, we don't have time for that. We've got to get to the next point so that you'll be able to pass the test. And speaking of not having time, <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> our thanks very much to Dr. Noam Chomsky, author most recently. <laughs> Noam Chomsky, author most recently of The Essential Chomsky. We also want to thank our audiences here in San Francisco and on the radio for the Commonwealth Club. I'm Larry Bensky, now this meeting of the Commonwealth Club of California, celebrating more than a century of enlightened discussion is adjourned.